Chapter 2, Escape of the Dead A sense of delicious dreaminess overcame me. My muscles relaxed, and I was on the point of giving way to my desire to sleep when the sound of approaching horses reached my ears. I attempted to spring to my feet, but was horrified to discover that my muscles refused to respond to my will. I was now thoroughly awake, but as unable to move a muscle as though turned to stone. It was then for the first time that I noticed a slight vapor filling the cave. It was extremely tenuous and only noticeable against the opening which led to daylight. There also came to my nostrils a faintly pungent odor, and I could only assume that I had been overcome by some poisonous gas. But why should I retain my mental faculties and yet be unable to move, I could not fathom. I lay facing the opening of the cave <clears throat> and where I could see the short stretch of trail which lay between the cave and the turn of the cliff around which the trail led. The noise of the approaching horses had ceased and I judged the Indians were creeping stealthily upon me along the little edge which led to my living tomb. I remember that I hoped they would make short work of me, as I did not particularly relish the thought of the innumerable things they might do to me if the spirit prompted them. I had not long to wait before a stealthy sound appraised me of their nearness, and then a war bonneted, paint-streaked face was thrust cautiously around the shoulder of the cliff, and savage eyes looked into mine. That he could see me in the dim light of the cave, I was sure, for the early morning sun was falling full upon me through the opening. <clears throat> the fellow, instead of approaching, merely stood and stared, his eyes bulging and his jaw dropped. And then another savage face appeared, and a third, and fourth, and fifth, craning their necks over their shoulders of their fellows whom they could not pass upon the narrow ledge. Each face was the picture of awe and fear. But for what reason I did not know, nor did I learn until ten years later. That there were still other braves behind those who regarded me was apparent for the fact that the leaders pressed, passed back, whispered word to those behind them. Suddenly a low but distinct moaning sound issued from the recesses of the cave behind me, and it, as it reached the ears of the Indians, they turned and fled in terror, panic-stricken, so frantic were their efforts to escape from the unseen thing behind me that one of the braves was hurled headlong from the cliff to the rocks below. Their wild cries echoed in the canyon for a short time, and then all was still once more. The sound which had frightened them was not repeated, but it had been sufficient as it was to start me speculating on the possible horror which lurked in the shadows at my back. Fear is a relative term, and so I can only measure my feelings at that time by what I had experienced in previous positions of danger and by those that I have passed through since. But I can say without shame that if the sensations I endured during the next few minutes were fear, then may God help the coward, for cowardice is of a surety its own punishment. <clears throat> to be held paralyzed with one's back towards some horrible and unknown danger, from the very sound of which the ferocious, ferocious Apache warriors turn in wild stampede as a flock of sheep would madly flee from a pack of wolves, seems to me the last word in fearsome predicaments for a man who had never been used to fighting for his life with all the energy of a powerful physique. Several times I thought I heard faint sounds behind me, as of somebody moving cautiously, but eventually even these ceased, and I was left to the contemplation of my position without interruption. I could but vaguely conjecture the cause of my paralysis, 
and my only hope lay in that it might pass off as suddenly as it had fallen upon me. Late in the afternoon, my horse, which had been standing with dragging rain before the cave, started slowly down the trail, evidently in search of food and water, and I was left alone with my mysterious unknown companion and the dead body of my friend, which lay just within my range of vision upon the ledge where I had placed it in the early morning. From then until possibly midnight, all was silence, the silence of the dead. Then suddenly the awful moan of the morning broke upon my startled ears. And there came again from the black shadows the sound of a moving thing and a faint rustling as of dead leaves. The shock to my already overstrained nervous system was terrible in the extreme and with a superhuman effort I strove to break my awful bonds. It was an effort of the mind, of the will, of the nerves, not muscular, for I could not move even so much as my little finger but nonetheless mighty for all that. And then something gave. There was a momentary feeling of nausea, a sharp click as of the snapping of a steel wire. And I stood with my back against the wall of the cave facing my unknown foe. And then the moonlight flooded the cave and there before me lay my own body as it had been lying all these hours with the eyes staring toward the open ledge and the hands resting limply on the ground. I looked first at my lifeless clay there upon the floor of the cave and then down at myself in utter bewilderment. For there I lay clothed and yet here I stood but naked as at the moment of my birth. The transition had been so sudden and so unexpected that it left me for a moment forgetful of aught else than my strange metamorphosis. My first thought was, is this then death? Have I indeed passed over forever into that other life? But I could not well believe this, as I could feel my heart pounding against my ribs from the exertion of my efforts to release myself from this anesthesis which had held me. My breath was coming in quick, short gasps, cold sweat stood out from every pore of my body, and the ancient experiment of pinching revealed the fact that I was anything other than a wraith. Again was I suddenly recalled to my immediate surroundings by a repetition of the weird moan from the depths of the cave. Naked and unarmed as I was, I had no desire to face the unseen thing which menaced me. My revolvers were strapped to my lifeless body, which was for some unfathomable reason I could not bring myself to touch. My carbine was in its boot, strapped to my saddle, and as my horse had wandered off, I was left without means of defense. My only alternative seemed to lie in flight and my decision was crystallized by a recurrence of the rustling sound that came the thing which now seemed in the darkness of the cave to my distorted imagination to be creeping stealthily upon me. Unable longer to resist the temptation to escape this horrible place, I leapt quickly through the opening into the starlight of clear Arizona night. The crisp fresh mountain air outside the cave acted as an immediate tonic and I felt new life and new courage coursing through me. Pausing upon the brink of the ledge, I upbraided myself for what now seemed to me wholly unwarranted apprehension. I reasoned with myself that I had lain helpless for many hours within the cave, yet nothing had molested me. In my better judgment, when permitted the direction of clear and logical reasoning, convinced me that the noises I had heard must have resulted from purely natural and harmless causes, probably from the conformation of the cave, was such that a slight breeze had caused the sound I heard. I decided to investigate, but first I lifted my head to fill my lungs with the pure, invigorating night air of the mountains. As I did so, I saw stretching far below me the beautiful vista of rocky gorge and level, 
cacti studded flat, wrought by the moonlight into a miracle of soft splendor and wondrous enchantment. Few Western wonders are more inspiring than the beauties of an Arizona moonlit landscape. The silvered mountains in the distance, the strange lights and shadows of hogback and arroyo, and the grotesque details of the stiff yet beautiful cacti form a picture at once enchanting and inspiring, as though one were catching for the first time a glimpse of some dead and forgotten world. So different is it from the aspect of any other spot upon our earth. As I stood thus meditating, I turned my gaze from the landscape to the heavens where the myriad stars formed a gorgeous and fitting canopy for the wonders of the earthly scene. My attention was quickly riveted by a large red star close to the distant horizon. As I gazed upon it, I felt a spell of overpowering fascination. It was Mars, the god of war, and for me, the fighting man. It had always held the powerful and irresistible enchantment. As I gazed at it, on that far gone night, it seemed to call across the unthinkable void to lure me to it, to draw me as the lodestone attracts a particle of iron. My longing was beyond the power of opposition. I closed my eyes, stretched out my arms towards the God of my vocation and felt myself, myself drawn with the suddenness of thought through the trackless immensity of space. There was an instant of extreme cold and utter darkness. <clears throat> Chapter three, my advent on Mars. I opened my eyes upon a strange and weird landscape. I knew that I was on Mars. Not once did I question either my sanity or my wakefulness. I was not asleep. No need for pinching here. My inner consciousness told me as plainly that I was upon Mars as your conscious mind tells you that you are upon Earth. You do not question the fact. Neither did I. I found myself lying prone upon a bed of yellowish moss-like vegetation, which stretched around me in all directions for interminable miles. I seemed to be lying in a deep circular basin, along the outer verge of which I could distinguish the irregularities of low hills. It was midday, the sun was shining full upon me, and the heat of it was rather intense upon my naked body. Yet no greater than would have been true under similar conditions on an Arizona desert. Here and there were site outcroppings of quartz bearing rock, which glistened in the sunlight. And a little to my left, perhaps a hundred yards, appeared a low walled enclosure, about four feet in height. No water and no vegetation other than moss was in evidence. And as I was somewhat thirsty, I determined to do a little exploring. Springing to my feet, I received my first Martian surprise for the effort, which on earth would have brought me standing upright, carried me into the Martian air to the height of about three yards. I alighted softly on the ground, however, without appreciable shock or jar now commenced a series of evolutions, which even then seemed ludicrous in the extreme, I found that I must learn to walk all over again, as the muscular exertion which carried me easily and safely upon Earth played strange antics with me upon Mars. Instead of progressing in a sane and dignified manner, my attempts to walk resulted in a variety of hops which took me clear of the ground a couple of feet at each step and landed me sprawling on my face or back at the end of each second or third hop. My muscles, perfectly attuned and accustomed to the force of gravity on Earth, played the mischief with me in attempting for the first time to cope with the lesser gravitation and lower air pressure on Mars. 
I was determined, however, to explore the low structure, which was only the only evidence of habitation in sight, and so I hit upon the unique plan of reverting to the first principles in locomotion, creeping. I did fa fairly well at this, and in a few moments had reached the low encircling wall of the enclosure. There appeared to be no doors or windows upon the side nearest me, but as the wall was but about four feet high, I cautiously gained my feet and peered over the top. Upon the strangest sight it had ever been given me to see. The roof of the enclosure was of solid glass, about four or five inches in thickness, and beneath this were several hundred large eggs, perfectly round and snowy white. The eggs were nearly uniform in size, being about two and one half feet in diameter. Five or six had already hatched, and the grotesque caricatures which sat blinking in the sunlight were enough to cause me to doubt my sanity. They seemed mostly head with little scrawny bodies, long necks and six legs, or as I afterward learned, two legs and two arms with an intermediate intermediary pair of limbs, which could be used at will either as arms or legs. Their eyes were set in the extreme sides of their heads, a trifle above the center and protruded in such a manner that they could be directed either forward or back. And also independently of each other, thus permitting this queer animal to look in any direction or in two directions at once without the necessity of turning the head. The ears, which were slightly above the eyes and closer together, were small cupped shaped antennae protruding not more than an inch on these young specimens. Their noses were but longitudinal slits in the center of their faces, midway between their mouths and ears. There was no hair on their bodies, which were of a very light yellowish green color. In the adults, as I was to learn quite soon, this color deepens to an olive green and is darker in the male than in the female. Further, the heads of the adults are not so out of proportion to their bodies as in the case of the young. The iris of the eyes is blood red, as in albinos, while the pupil is dark. The eyeball itself is very white, as are the teeth. These latter add a most ferocious appearance to an otherwise fearsome and terrible countenance, as the lower tusk tusks curved upward to sharp points which end about where the eyes of earthly human beings are located. The whiteness of the teeth is not that of ivory, but of the snow, snowiest and most gleaming of China. Against the dark background of their olive skins, their tusks stand out in a most striking manner, making these weapons present a singularly formidable appearance. Most of these details I noted later, for I was given but little time to speculate on the wonders of my new discovery. I had seen that the eggs were in the process of hatching, and as I stood watching the hideous little monsters break from their shells, I failed to note the approach of a score of full-grown Martians from behind me. Coming as they did over the soft and soundless moths, which covers practically the entire surface of Mars, with the exception of the frozen areas at the poles and the scattered cultivated districts, they might have captured me easily, but their intentions were far more sinister. It was the rattling of the accoutrements of the foremost warrior which warned me. On such a little thing my life hung, but I often marvel that I escaped so easily. Had not the rifle of the leader of the party swung from its fastenings beside his saddle in such a way as to strike against the butt of his great metal shod spear, I should have snuffed out without ever knowing that death was near me. But the little sound caused me to turn 
and there upon me, not ten feet from my breast, was the point of that huge spear, a spear forty feet long, tipped with m gleaming metal, and held low at the side of a mounted replica of the little devils I had been watching. But how puny and harmless they now looked beside this huge and terrific incarnation of hate, of vengeance, and of death. The man himself, for such I may call him, was fully fifteen feet in height. On earth would have weighed some four hundred pounds. He sat his mount as we sit a horse, grasping the animal's barrel with his lower limbs, while the hands of his two right arms held his immense spear low at the side of his mount. His two left arms were outstretched laterally to help preserve his balance. The thing he rode, having neither bridle or reins or any description of guidance. And his mount, how can earthly words describe it? It towered 10 feet at the shoulder, had four legs on either side, a broad flat tail, larger at the tip than at the root, and which it held straight out behind while running, a gaping mouth which spit, splits its head from its snout to its long, massive neck. Like its masters, it was ex entirely devoid of hair, but was a dark slate color and exceeding smooth and glossy. Its belly was white and its legs shaded from the slate of its shoulders and its hips to a vivid yellow at the feet. The feet themselves were heavily padded and nailless, which fact had also contributed to the noiselessness of their approach. And in common with the, a multiplicity of legs, it's a characteristic feature of the fauna of Mars, the highest type of man and one other animal, an only mammal existing on Mars, alone have well-formed nails. And there are absolutely no hoofed animals in existence there. Behind this first charging demon trailed 19 others, similar in all respects. But as I learned later, bearing individual characteristics particular to themselves, precisely as no two of us are identical, although we are all cast in a similar mold. This picture, or rather materialized nightmare, which I have described at length, made but one terrible and swift impression on me as I turned to meet it. Unarmed and naked as I was, the first law of nature manifested itself in the only possible solution of my immediate problem, and that was to get out of the vicinity of the point of the charging spear. Consequently, I gave a very earthly and at the same time superhuman leap to reach the top of the Martian incubator for such I had determined it must be. My effort was crowned with a success which appalled me, no less than it seemed to surprise the Martian warriors, for it carried me fully 30 feet into the air and landed me a 100 feet from my pursuers and on the opposite end of the enclosure. I alighted upon the soft moss easily without mishap and turning saw my enemies lined up along the further wall. Some were surveying me with expressions which I afterward discovered marked extreme astonishment, and the others were evidently satisfying themselves that I had not molested their young. They were conversing together in low tones and gesticulating and pointing towards me the discovery that I had not harmed the little Martians and that I was unarmed must have caused them to look upon me with less ferocity. But as I was to learn later, the thing which weighed most in my favor was my exhibition of hurtling. While the Martians are immense, their bones are very large and they are muscled only in proportion to the gravitation which they must overcome. The result is that they are infinitely less agile and less powerful. 
in proportion to their weight than an earthman. And I doubt that were one of them suddenly to be transported to earth, he could lift his own weight from the ground. In fact, I'm convinced that he could not do so. My feet then was as marvelous upon Mars as it would have been upon earth. And from desiring to annihilate me, they suddenly looked upon me as a wonderful discovery to be captured and exhibited among their fellows. <clears throat> the respite my unexpected agility had given me permitted me to formulate plans for the immediate future and to note more closely the appearance of the warriors, for I could not dissociate these people in my mind from those other warriors who, only the day before, had been pursuing me. I noted that each was armed with several other weapons in addition to the huge spear which I have described. The weapon which caused me to decide against an attempt at escape by flight was what was evidently a rifle of some description on which I felt for some reason they were particularly efficient in handling. These rifles were of a white metal stocked with wood which I learned later was a very light and intensely hard growth much prized on Mars and entirely unknown to us denizens of Earth. The metal of the barrel is an alloy composed principally of aluminum and steel, which they have learned to temper to a hardness far exceeding that of the steel with which we are familiar. The weight of these rifles is comparatively little, and with the small caliber, explosive, radium projectiles which they use, and the great length of the barrel, they are deadly in the extreme, and at ranges which would be unthinkable on earth. The theoretic effective radius of this rifle is 300 miles, but the best they can do in actual service when equipped with their wireless finders and sighters is but a trifle over 200 miles. This is quite far enough to imbue me with a great respect for the Martian firearm, and some telepathic force must have warned me against an attempt to escape in broad daylight from under the muzzles of 20 of these death-dealing machines. The Martians, after conversing for a short time, turned and rode away in the direction from which they had come, leaving one of their number alone by the enclosure. When they had covered perhaps 200 yards, they halted, and turning their mounts towards us, sat watching the warrior by the enclosure. He was the one whose spear had so nearly transfixed me and was evidently the leader of the band. As I had noted that they seemed to have moved to their present position at his direction. When his force had come to a halt, he dismounted, threw down his spear and small arms and came around the end of the incubator toward me, entirely unarmed and as naked as I, except for the ornaments strapped upon his head, limbs and breast. When he was within about 50 feet of me, he unclasped an enormous metal armlet and holding it toward me in the open palm of his hand addressed me in a clear resonant voice, but in a language it is needless to say I could not understand. He then stopped as though waiting for my reply. <clears throat> Pricking up his antennae like ears, and cocking his strange looking eyes still further toward me. As the silence became painful, I concluded to hazard a little conversation on my own part, as I had guessed that he was making overtures of peace. The throwing down of his weapons and the withdrawing of his troop before his advance toward me would have signified a peaceful mission anywhere on earth, so why not then on Mars? Placing my hand over my heart, I bowed low to the Martian and explained to him that while I did not understand his language, his actions spoke for the peace and friendship that at the present moment were most dear to my heart. Of course, I might have been a babbling brook for all the intelligence my speech carried to him, but he understood the action with which I immediately followed my words. Stretching my hand toward him, I advanced and took the armlet from his open palm. 
clasping it about my own arm above the elbow, smiled at him and stood waiting. His wide mouth spread into an unanswering smile and locking one of his intermediary arms in mine, we turned and walked back towards his mount. At the same time, he motioned his followers to advance. They started towards us on a wild run, but were checked by a signal from him. Evidently, he feared that were I to be really frightened again, I might jump entirely out of the landscape. He exchanged a few words with his men motioned to me that I would ride behind one of them, and then mounted his own animal. The fellow designated reached down two or three hands and lifted me up behind him on the glossy back of his mount, where I hung on as best I could by the belts and straps which held the Martian's weapons and ornaments. The entire cavalcade then turned and galloped away toward the range of hills in the distance.